Welcome everybody to another week of Game Wisdom Live. This is going to be for the week of November 16th, 2017. We are one week away from Thanksgiving. And of course, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and all that other great holiday-related shenanigans that's bound to happen. Joining me as always, video game producer Robert Leach. Hello. Hey Rob, how are you doing? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. Uh, how about yourself? Eh, I am doing all right. It's been an interesting week, and also for you guys watching, let me know if I'm looking like off-centered or anything, because I did some adjusting of the screen just before we started. But it's definitely been a very interesting week. El Gordo is ready to talk about loot boxes, I think, tonight, and we got more of that to discuss. In terms of the YouTube channel, I know I think we're getting close to hitting 2,500 subscribers. Uh, let me see, what are we at right now? If YouTube decides to be kind and load. 2470. So we are getting up there. And again, for anyone new, thank you so much for subscribing. And I hope you're enjoying the content. I did do an update on Patreon earlier for a new mini goal. That we can hit $150 a month. I'll do kind of like a behind the scenes vlog that's pa basically uh, patrons only for each month. Kind of talk about the things that are going on like around here with me. You know, stuff that's more related to what's going on with game wisdom rather than just game industry and stuff like that. Because I know Gordo is dying to see all my collector's guides and uh, box editions that are around here. If you guys missed the news, I actually had my first ever uh, game design consultant meeting earlier this week. And that was very interesting. I met with a guy who's trying to put together, like, I think he said it was going to be, like, his first, like, full game. Like, he's done, like, mobile, or, I'm sorry, he's done browser games before. But he's trying to make, like, his first Steam game. So we talked for about, like, an hour and ten minutes. And he said he's been talking to some other consultants regarding pricing and what they can offer, and he'll get back to me hopefully by the end of this week. So we'll see what happens on that front. But for those of you who missed the announcement, Rob is going to be starting a new job, I believe you said next week, at Take Two. I always get uh, Take Two and 2K. It's 2K, right? Well, it's both. Uh, they... So it's a week from Monday. <laughs> yeah, Take Two owns the 2K sports <laughs> franchises. Um, so yeah, visual concepts will be the uh, company I work for directly, and mm -hmm. then take two after them. Mm -hmm. I think they just that to confuse me, because I've always got trouble differentiating take two and 2K from each other. But Yeah, no, same thing. Yeah. Well, the first time I, I heard about that takeover, it took me a while. <laughs> and uh, for those of you watching this, as a quick heads up, obviously next Thursday is going to be Thanksgiving, at least here in the United States, so Rob and I will be taking off for that week. And... For the following week, Rob may not be available for the stream, so um, he'll let me know probably closer to that week, and it will either be just myself, or we'll need to get a relief co-host for that week. We'll see what happens. Oh, hey, hey, son. Hey, son. How are you doing? Uh, let me see. Anything else uh, site or news related? Oh, uh, in case you guys, I'm sure I didn't mention this but I'm going to be doing some temporary work in December, basically just Monday and Fridays. So it's going to be I'll be a little bit off on those days, but it's only going to be for the month, at least for right now. But just as a heads up, anyone trying to get in touch with me on those days, I will be uh, indisposed of. <laughs> Take to the loot boxes. Yep, exactly. <laughs> you have to open loot boxes to get a paycheck. Well, that's what they tell me. <laughs> it's also a health insurance loot box. There's so uh, many. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about last week, once Rob starts, he's going to pitch the idea of the Josh box or the Rob box to take two for their next uh, loot box game. <laughs> yeah, just a random link to a podcast or YouTube uh, recording. Or a loot box within a loot box, which is my luck. That's right. what the Josh box is right there. And again, if you take that idea, though, I better not be seeing that on... Uh, uh, I guess that would be like uh, NBA 2018, whatever happens next year. Ne uh, 2019, 2019. Oh, 2019. Oh, yeah, that's but right. I'm, not working, I'm actually not working on that core product. I'm working on the E-League. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'll be dealing with loot boxes. We'll see how that goes. I have no idea. <laughs> well, uh, again, definitely the best of luck. I'm sure we'll be all uh, waiting to see what loot boxes you'll bring to the cast when you return <laughs> after you start. <laughs> 
Sounds good. I'll I'll have to uh, I'll have to see what the release form says. What I can talk about loot box ways. <laughs> and um, also for those of you watching this, if you know of any developers or you are an indie developer who would like to talk to me about doing game design consulting work, like I said, the the service is now being offered. There are links to my guide and video on GameWisdom.com under services. So. Any help with spreading the word on that front would definitely be great. I'll be doing more tweets about it over the following weeks. So we'll see if I can get a few clients that way. You never know, right? Exactly. That's what you got to do. Sow mm -hmm. the seed. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, and one other thing. If you missed the announcement video, tomorrow at 5 p.m. EST, there will not be a regular Perceptive podcast this week. I'll be doing one live with Game Economist Ramid... Uh, I cannot pronounce his last name on command, or I'm going to butcher it, but he is a regular over on Gama Sutra. He has studied microtransactions, monetization, and loot boxes. <laughs> Thank you, Elgordo. Offer loot boxes with your services, yes. But he is an expert on that. He's been dealing with it for, I think, over 17 years now. I think he's been following it, and he's been like ahead of the trend there. So this will be essentially part two of our chat with part one being a recorded podcast in a few weeks but we are going to be talking everything there is to know about loot boxes gotcha free to play and of course we'll be talking about why loot boxes are gambling and probably a lot more live for you folks so be sure to tune in for that and i'm going to say right now bring some drinks and a snack with you because i have a feeling that it's going to be a very long <laughs> podcast with the two of us but, I think with all that said, um, how can we offer loot boxes, Rob? You should ask Take 2 that when you start working. Like, what's the best, like, can they give us any loot box tips for... Uh... Wow. Wow. I don't, I don't want to start my, start my uh, <laughs> career there just saying, hey, what about loot boxes? I hear you guys are loot box experts. <laughs> the, give uh, me some loot box info. The guards will come down from the ceiling and just uh, gently squirt you out the building there. <laughs> well, like I say, it's it's a subsidiary of Visual Concepts, mm -hmm. which works on NBA mm -hmm. uh, 2K series. <laughs> They're in, uh, those guys are located in uh, North San Francisco, um, North Bay Area, I should say. And we're located in, uh, s like, South Orange County. So, God, 60 miles south of Los Angeles. Cool. Uh, let's see. So... Uh, for games this way, I know we got some games and news related talk. I'll start with you again, Rob. Have you had a chance to play any new games this week? No, no, I have not. I've been, uh, this whole uh, work transition has just completely sidelined me, so sadly. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we're entering the winter months, which means that new releases are going to slowly but surely disappear. I know Injustice 2 just came out on PC the other day. I was thinking about picking that up, but I don't know if my computer can handle it, and I remember what they did with Mortal Kombat 10 when it was released on the PC a few years ago. What was that? Uh, they It was very much a bad port job. Uh, connection issues, uh, technical issues, memory leaks, and all that other wonderful stuff for a PC release. Yeah. Yeah, this week I played a few games that didn't really excite me. I did my post about this the other day, but I played Tower 57 and The Mummy The Mastered, and neither game really, like, stood out to me. Like, they weren't bad games, but like, I just didn't really feel anything after I was done playing them. And I guess here's an interesting question for you, Rob, considering your experience with producing and, of course, publishing in the games. Like, do you think there is room for average games today? You know, not the hit makers, but those that just kind of come out, they maybe will have like a week or two in the sun, and then they just, you know, disappear into the ether. Um, I think not. I think it's going away. I think it is. There's, uh, I mean, having worked in that publishing side of things, um, it the average game is, mm -hmm. like, you look at the bell curve, right? And mm -hmm. average would be in the middle at the height of this giant bell curve. But now the top of the bell curve is starting to get a little bit higher, which is to say the high quality stuff is getting more and more and more numerous. Mm -hmm. And the average quality stuff is certainly just going to continue to expand. But uh, because so many quality games are, are available and they're starting to be cheaper and cheaper, mm -hmm. 
yeah, people aren't going to be as interested unless you know the person making it or whatever. I've seen firsthand that the interest level of that kind of thing is super low these days. Even just looking through my queue on Steam, mm -hmm. um, you look at a game that has okay graphics and is re recently released, and you'll see less than uh, even less than 20 reviews, and that's mm -hmm. that just kind of speaks to where things are at. Yeah. And as you said, Rob, a lot of the games we're seeing these days, it's really become almost feast and famine for a lot of these indie games. They either come out and do really, really well, or we just never hear from them after opening week. Well, uh, and yeah, there's the feast or famine uh, from a perspective, from a distance. But generally speaking, the famine comes from no outreach. Um, or at least very limited outreach, developer outreach in particular. And then um, the the famine comes and yeah, sorry, the famine comes with that. And the feast can only really it's it's lucky either way. It really is. Uh, because there are so many good quality titles out there. If you hit, then you hit. If if not, you sh you hopefully do okay enough to uh, get you onto that next project. Yeah. And, and that was like the weird thing with playing something like Tower 57. Like, I was going into it expecting, I think, more from that title, considering, like, all, like, the unique stuff around it, and, of course, the fact that it survived its Kickstarter process. But we finished it in just about two hours on stream, maybe even less than that if it wasn't for some technical issues. Jeez. And that is very that's one of those very weird things because we've seen people discuss you know the price to hours ratio when it comes to video games there are people out there who feel that you know it's supposed to be like a dollar an hour which is just crazy for a lot of games but there's always been that discussion of just you know how long should a game be i know the easy answer of course is it's as long as it should be kind of thing but it's just very hard to get that across to a lot of people yeah, I know that the discussion of um, cost versus time spent is has been going on, you know, since I was a kid. Um, usually, I think six hours would be the bottom out. Like, if you can't play six hours, then it's not worth your money or time. Mm -hmm. Well, um, but these days, yeah, so many games are short, um, and short being anywhere from like a half hour to a couple of hours, mm -hmm. and those are generally like the the walking sims and. Um, the oh god, I'm gonna mess this up. Basically, what amounts to the choose your own adventure games, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that kind of stuff tends to be short. Um, and there's there's a fan base, so you know there's something good there. Uh, how much was the game you're talking about? Uh, Tower Fifty Seven was one second. It was ten dollars right now, but it's on the launch promotion, so we'll go up to twelve dollars after the week is over. Mm, that's tough. It, it really is tough because um, uh, Walking Sims is not what I'm trying to to consider. That's that's a different kind of game. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, twelve dollars is a weird one. Ten dollars is a weird one because certainly you can buy massive games uh, for that amount. A little older, maybe uh, some definitely indie, but always massive. You can you can get games that have almost limitless playtime. Um, for that amount, but ten dollars seems seems okay for a really good two hour game. Mm -hmm. I know um, the Stanley Parable. Uh, it was well worth the amount I paid, mm -hmm. even though it, even with all of the different endings, it's a very short game. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the quality, it's the experience that you're really paying for. So uh, if you can have the perfect experience, I think it's worth you know any amount of money really you can sell it for. Yeah. And again, there's just so many games that you just never know how much you're really going to get out of them. Like The Buying of Isaac, I'm up to like 100 hours in that game. I may have spent like $15, $16 on that. Yeah. Or uh, for people really get in their games, I have friends who've played thousands of hours of Team Fortress, uh, Counter-Strike, uh, League of Legends, and so on. So it's really hard to put a acceptable hour when it comes to a lot of video games. Yeah, and when it comes to the free free to play games, they basically are forced to have incredibly mm -hmm. long gameplay. So if you don't want to spend any money, you can still have a ton of games to play. And I know one of my favorite tricks on cell phone is 
have a bunch of games you like and then if you run out of like uh, play credits or whatever on one you just move to the next until your play credits re revive and then you can mm -hmm. go back and play the first one uh, boy it's a, it's a fun little mm -hmm. management technique <laughs> Yeah, and speaking about those games, this whole week has been me trying to find a really good mobile game to play, and I'm just really striking out. The ones that I do like, they eventually hit that wall where it's like, now I have to grind for so many hours in order to move forward, or they just hit you right off the front with it, with stuff like, as I did in my review of South Park Phone Destroyer, Clash Royale... Uh, there's this other one that was like a war or military game with co with the various things. And it just gets very annoying just to see nothing but those kinds of games. And I mean, I'm giving up or I'm stopped playing them within like minutes. But what about the people who are spending, you know, hundreds of dollars on these titles and then moving on to the next and the next? Yeah, uh, one quick thing, uh, Elgardo, if you can remember the name of that game, uh, message me on on uh, Discord or just mention it there, because I'd be interested mm -hmm. um, in in playing that one or at least looking into it more deeply. But uh, about the mobile stuff, it depends what kind of game you like, um, because there are games out there that are casual that really have mm -hmm. limitless content, more or less, that really don't get you stuck too bad. Um, yeah, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. The there are a lot of quality ports of PC games, but I do not. Um, I don't know if I if I approve of that on mobile. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just it's just a matter of preference. Uh, it's mm -hmm. I like the experience on the PC way better on for most of these games. <laughs> uh, like I have Roller Coaster Tycoon on my phone, uh, and it basically it's a mishmash of one and two, mm -hmm. and I can get the same thing on Steam, and it just has way more detail and way more UI. Um, part of the problem is UI. Part of the problem is yeah. how much memory you can have. Yeah, the, but okay. uh, I was just going to say for the free to play thing, it, you you have to figure out what kind of genre you want. And if you, because the mobile is specialty casual games, you're going to find a ton there. But if you want to get more arcadey and more AAA kind of stuff, you're going to have a much tougher time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking about the UI. I am just not a fan of a touch UI. I don't know about you or anyone else watching, but it just feels very cumbersome to me, you know, with having to, like, do, like, these weird gestures with your hand to, like, zoom in or out or rotate. Again, I grew up with keyboard and mouse. Like, my hands are going to be, like, permanently in, like, the uh, mouse claw position, I think, till the day I die. So this just feels, like, very weird to me. I don't think I'm ever going to get used to it. Well, I'm, obviously you have some uh, utility with a controller. Mm -hmm. So uh, me personally, like I took to the touch screens very, very well. Um, you got to get used to it because it's going to be uh, around for a long time until, of course, it's just hand gestures like like they have for the Xbox and eventually you're just going to be inside of a hologram, which would be kind of fun. <laughs> the holodeck. That's what everybody's waiting for is the holodeck. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll get that next year, right? That'll be the next step from VR. <laughs> but, um, like, getting back to, like, the mobile design, like, of course, we'll probably be talking about this tomorrow as well, but, like, South Park, the film industry game, that just really rubbed me the wrong way, considering that they were saying, oh, we're not going to make it pay to win, there won't be a lot of microtransactions, and it just hits you with it very early in that game. And I think what's very interesting is that all these games tend to play the exactly the same way with how they structure their uh, loot boxes and their progression model because it's all been done through analytics. They know exactly at what points to you know push the difficulty curve up, what point to introduce another purchase or a loot box, and you can really see I think like the science behind the scenes there. Uh, honestly, I think that a lot of the companies don't quite understand it, but it's so easy to reverse engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, you just play through a game, jot down all the numbers, and just copy it. It's so easy to reverse engineer. You just do that, and you might not quite understand it, and you might not quite know how to integrate it with your title, mm -hmm. but it's they, that's one reason I believe they all feel the same. Um, mm -hmm. At some point, you or they just hire the same people. There's like five people in the industry. They all have the, <laughs> the same thing going on. Uh, but yeah, I would say that a game like that is really just a white label, you know, cookie cutter engine with South Park or Family Guy or any of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no need for them to really invest in a lot of design if all they're selling is IP. 
Yep. And there are so many more of those IP-driven IP games out there on the mobile scene. Especially, as you said, Rob, with the casual kind of gameplay, really uh, affords itself to be fit into just about any structure, any different property that you can think of. Yeah, uh, by casual, I'm mostly thinking of things like Match 3 mm -hmm. and uh, Hidden Object and, oh, yes. um, you know, things like Bingo, like a lot of the Fog, faux gambling games. Mm -hmm. Bucket Detective. Interesting. I have not heard of that one. Let's see. Oh, it's available on PC as well. I think Is he's talking about PC oh. ports, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I think he's talking about the uh, Stanley Powerball. Oh, the Stanley Powerball. Okay. Let me. I have to write that down or else I'm going to forget it. Hold on. <laughs> Pause while I search on Steam. Pause while I search on Steam. Uh, oh, yeah, now that's... Steam decides to take a while. Great. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, uh, Rob Steam. is uh, doing that. Um, we can certainly... I'm trying to think if there's any other games I had a chance to play this week. And I'm not... Oh, we, I did try a Star Traders... Where is it? Star Traders Frontiers last night. And it's one of those games that it just completely... I bounced off of it. There was it's a uh, space kind of simulator game, like you're trading, you're going around doing missions, and it looks like there's a whole lot of depth to it or depth. But the problem is that it doesn't explain anything to a new player, so I had no idea what I was doing for it the entire hour of playing that game, and I was just like, I'm just pushing buttons here and hoping something happens. I missed the title. Which game? Star Traders Frontiers. Oh, right, right, okay. And we've talked about this before, but there is a real art to like that kind of pick up and play feel that we see from a lot of the best games. That really, they uh, explain everything so well you can just immediately start playing and growing your understanding of it. I mentioned this on Discord the other night, but I'm still waiting for like a true follow up to Star Control Two, in that sense that I can just start playing it and I can get into it very quickly, as opposed to a lot of modern space kind of games that require, you know, several hours of tutorials just to figure out what it is you're doing. I have that uh, problem with Endless Space. Mm -hmm. I know they have the sequel out. I've not tried that one, but Endless Space had that problem. I know Son, if he's still watching, probably had all kinds of frustration <laughs> watching me, you know, just kludge my way through it. Um, I think I find that for a lot of basically menu driven or, or database driven games um, that all the numbers are there but it's so complex they make mm -hmm. the whole thing so complicated with m menus and sub menus and sub menus on top of that um, that describing how everything interacts just is a just a giant pain in the butt mm -hmm. and as we said there are so many games being released these days that you really don't have the time to dig into a game to even see if you like it you can just immediately move on to the next game on your list, and the next one, and the next. Yeah, I think games these days assume you're either like a jack of all trades, you play them all a little bit, or you're a master of a few, mm -hmm. and you just dump all your hours there, because, yeah, you're right, you can't, there is no time to play everything. There just isn't. Mm -hmm. And it just is a shame, because I think a lot of any developers are missing out on potential new fans by not taking the time to create a good tutorial or at least understand how someone new is going to look at their game and build you know like the first 15 to 20 minutes around it yeah it's one of those those things though uh we had discussed this a little while ago mm -hmm. um what kind of uh patron what kind of audience are you are you making this game for if you're making this game for that kind of genre where it's you know, the menu-driven space mm -hmm. science fiction kind of game, well, are you going to be pointing to people who really love that kind of detail and stuff and aren't that interested in a simple tutorial? Or are you trying to get new people into the genre, in which case you definitely need a simple tutorial? Or maybe it's just people like you who enjoyed a game uh, from a long time ago and are just looking for that similar experience mm -hmm. without having to read an encyclopedia just to get going. Yeah. And again, it's one of those things that it sounds like everyone should be on the same page when it comes to creating a tutorial, but we see this all the time with a lot of unique games where there's just no guidance. And then how are you supposed to figure a game out? There's no reference that you can pull from another game. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, 
like you say, you know, you have you like a particular genre, you're trying to make one, and, and yeah, all you have is this gobbledygook <laughs> to, to reference. It's it's hard to get out of that cycle. It really is. Yeah. Now, I guess in terms of, I like, guess, moving on to news that's been happening this week, of course, what seems to have been, like, the big bang over this week has been Battlefront 2, and how at the start of the week there were reports that would take, like, 40 hours to unlock like the w- one end game hero then there is a whole AMA disaster on Reddit the other day and now EA as of about an hour ago and of course I think the game is coming out tomorrow I think that was the last thing I heard they decide to remove the ability to purchase in game currency or in game items so they're turning off the microtransactions but the game is still I think bounced around said microtransactions so this has been a very interesting week for Battlefront 2, to say the least. 2100 to get all the content. Oof. Now, certainly, that it's funny that you say that because there's a lot of the games on mobile that I play um, that if they could extract all the money in the world, um, $2,100 wouldn't buy you half the game. Yeah, I know. It's so depressing. It's so mm. depressing. Um, but, like, like, for example, each level... If you can't go to a new level, it, you either have to wait 12 hours for that new level to unlock, mm-hmm. or you can pay a dollar. And there's hundreds of levels. So at a certain point, if you're just if you're just wanting to get through all the levels, you have to pay hundreds of dollars. Mm-hmm. And that's just the one charge. There's other charges for additional energy and all that crud. It's mm-hmm. it's highway robbery. Yeah. And as Alberto was saying in chat, that's what I was saying on Twitter that. This doesn't sound like something as simple as just flicking a switch and everything is good. Like, it sounds like this game has very much had microtransactions as a part of its design almost from square one, at least from the multiplayer angle. So turning it off just seems like, I don't know, it seems like a half gesture to me. Well, it it seems, yeah, I agree with that, certainly. Um, maybe they're just going to allow you to earn the, the in-game currency. Um mm-hmm. And that's how it'll do it. That's how you make it fair, is you just earn in-game currency, and then that's that's it. Um, now, certainly, I don't know if it's, if it's exactly like that, because I don't know if we have yet to see something like that. I think this is a new one. Um, I have worked with games that removed a, a pay-to-play or a free-to-play aspect, but that, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens of this. I'd like to see if your analogy, El Gordo, is correct, or if it's going to be just a little, a little weird, but not entirely. Um, the flaws will certainly show oh, up. Oh yeah, That's regardless, nice. we'll see. It'll be an interesting. Uh, let's keep our fingers on the pulse of this one. <laughs> I'm just glad I don't have to review it because I've heard like people on Twitter complain that I wrote my review and then they changed, so I got to rewrite it again, and I have to rewrite it a third time. So they are definitely getting their uh, work. Uh, taken out from them by EA this week. EA is looking to you for for their uh, (laughs) design adjustments. (laughs) And uh, there's also I I was watching people play the new Need for Speed game that also has loot box integration in that as well. And it doesn't seem like it's going to be getting better anytime soon. No, I think I mean, since the loot box concept has done so well in mobile and so well mm-hmm. in free to play, um, I believe. Pe- I mean, the AAA t- studios are like, you know what? We can't. There's we can't lose here, and not realizing that the AAA audience is a little bit different and and less interested in being nickel and dimed. Um, now, I don't know how. It, I'm actually very interested. I think Ramin is going to be able to. Obviously, you got your guys' discussion tomorrow mm-hmm. is going to nail a lot of these questions yeah. in much better fashion than than I certainly could and I don't think we can either since he'll bring up a lot of aspects that you know mm-hmm. he knows like the back of his hand so I'd like to see that and and, and maybe we can follow up <laughs> two weeks from then mm-hmm. and just just kind of digest everything he has to say as mm-hmm. as uh, plebeians to his mm-hmm. to his mastery so oh, it'd be yeah. kind of interesting to to go over and, and just take from yeah and I think I agree with El Coro that it, this is very much the experimental phase when it comes to loot box yeah. and AAA games. I mean, we're seeing different pushes between Call of Duty, Overwatch, Need for Speed, Battlefront 2, and oh, and I think th- th- does Assassin's Creed have loot boxes, or was that the only one that kind of escaped the loot box wrath? 
for now. Mm-hmm. Combo, I don't know. We're... We'll talk next year about it, I bet. <laughs> now, um, I guess here's another interesting piece of news, and we'll probably come back to the loot box in a few minutes, but I want to bring this up, that it has been confirmed that Marvel Heroes, the free-to-play ARPG game, is, let's see, that uh, it's going to be shut down. Apparently, Disney has pulled their contract from Gazillion Entertainment, who are the developers behind it. Or I think they could have been the second team that developed it. The game's been through multiple iterations over the last few years, since it launched in 2013. And it's now being ended. And what that means, of course, is that... Oh, thank you, Gordo. So Assassin's Creed has microtransactions, but no loot boxes. Yet. Exactly. But yeah, it's going to be... So without having the license from Disney anymore, there's no game, essentially, because you can't sell a game with Marvel characters if you don't have that IP. So No. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, so that means, of course, that the game is going to stop. And that is kind of like one of those very weird things. So what do you think, Rob? Oh, I mean, the way I look at it is that, yes, they can't do it anymore. They could certainly go their own and... I mean, I hate to continue bringing up these mm-hmm. like Planet Coaster and that, but that that has that same kind of branch. Roller Coaster Tycoon, um, they worked on the third one, but for the fourth one, they had to go somewhere else. They did it in house and called it Planet Coaster. Mm-hmm. So in this case, they could branch off and do it themselves, do their own quasi superhero mm-hmm. themed one, or um, and then Disney can do the same thing. They can just go like, you know what? We're taking our Marvel and, and finding someone whose vision is something we can mm-hmm. embrace. Um, mm-hmm. It's such a weird uh, business thing that goes on, this this dance between IP and development and even, even uh, publishing and development like EA or Activision. Um, mm-hmm. It's such a, it's a tough, weird business. Yeah. And I guess as a perfect thing, I just looked up the news piece about it today, and Ramin's already commented on it on Kama Sutra. So I think that'll be another thing to bring up tomorrow when we have him on. But, cool. yeah, like, and that's one of the weird things. And it's not just with a licensed game like this, but with any free-to-play or, you know, heavily invested game like this. Like, if you sink $400, 500 $600 on a game like this, and the game gets pulled or it goes under, that $600 is gone. You're never going to see that money again. And it's one of those thoughts that's been, I think, a back of a lot of people's heads about free-to-play or even just about online games in general. Like, I'm just wondering, like, games like, of course, City of Heroes, um, EverQuest, the sequel or the spiritual sequel that kind of failed. Like, what happens when you invest all this money in these games that... If they're online dependent, means once those servers are pulled, you're done. Like there's nothing more you can do. Well, I, I mean, if it's a tough thing, because right, I spent sixty dollars to buy, um, name a Nintendo game or or a Super Mario, Super Nintendo game that I owned, even Atari for God's sakes. Um, I can't really go back and and play that. Not that I'd want to, but. Um, it has that kind of thing. You invest the money and it, and it goes away at a certain mm-hmm. point. Now, because of the weird kind of staying power that a server has, uh, it certainly changes things. Because, yeah, you can invest an awful lot of money into something and it could go away and you feel like you're lost. Mm-hmm. Like if World of Warcraft were just to, you know, <laughs> die tomorrow, I think there would be looting in the streets. But oh. um, that's kind of the nature of the boy. What would happen? Uh, what I would think... happen if that <laughs> I was just thinking, I think <laughs> that would cause the downfall of civilization. I think that's what will send us <laughs> so, into post-apocalyptic times right there. <laughs> oh, boy. I think, we just, I think we just came up with the next uh, big blockbuster post-apocalyptic world. Yeah. Day after World yeah. of Warcraft ends, or it goes down. <laughs> oh, it could be a new ARPG, you know. Exactly. The whole setting is that the all of the big time MMOs went down, and everyone has to stave off their boredom, boredom and anger that mm-hmm. they normally get rid of in the game. And so, and civilization ended the next day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like we talk about this a lot with these kinds of games. Like you brought Nintendo. Like that's one of the things we talk about with game preservation: the fact that. It's getting harder and harder to play these older games, especially, like, I guess, br- 
<laughs> exactly, Elgardo. The Rock can star in that game. He'll be the best World of Warcraft player. And yeah, there's a. I don't know if you heard this, Rob. There, they just released a trailer for the Rampage movie based on the Interesting. old. Interesting. And it stars The Rock in that too. Interesting. I met. I actually worked with the guy who made Rampage. Nice. Yeah, I've, that was like my my starstruck moment for from the developer world. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like when it comes to these kinds of game preservation, like bring this back to EA. EA is notorious for shutting down servers to some of their older games. Now, when it's a sports game, you know. Uh, Madden 2012 and Madden 2013, you know, people are already moved on to the next one. But when they shut down the servers for Battle for Middle Earth 2, one of the games I really like, they took off an entire mode of that game. You can't play it online anymore. And that's one of those issues when you have these games that are built on online functionality. Or even something like SimCity, the latest one that kind of died. You know, they were heralding as, you know, this next big online game and everyone just completely turned against it because they didn't want to deal with that if there was a server issue. Yeah, it's one of the, it's a weird thing because you see, and I'm wondering if I'm wondering how Runic does this because they say there's going to be news about Torchlight Two yeah. in the coming days, and I'm waiting for that news, and I'm wondering if they're going to somehow keep the server going through fans or whatever, or even if they're just branching off and going to make another game. Who knows? Um, but that's the kind of thing that these days. You can leverage a fan base to keep that going. Certainly, when it when there's popular IP on the line, whether it be you know like um, Disney, like Marvel mm-hmm. stuff, you know there's a tricky thing right there because you can't just let random people deal with these mm-hmm. uh, expensive you know uh, properties. Uh, but for something that a publisher owns, mm-hmm. um, they should be able to just kind of hand it off and guide uh, a fan based server. Um, because it's unlikely they're going to create new content. Uh, they just want their game as is for the remainder of time. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. You, you should be able to leverage that kind of thing. Crowdsource it. Yeah. Now, I was reading the forum on Steam for Moral Heroes, and a lot of people said that the game has been on decline. Now, I, I think I only tried, like, one time years ago, so I have no in-game experience with it. But they said that they have done changes to those game systems. So it could have been a case of, you know, developer intervention messing with things or causing the formula to break down. But it's one of those problems that I think as we see more and more games get licenses and even with more, I don't know what uh, Viralis is talking about there, but um, as time goes on, we're going to be seeing, I think, more issues along these lines, especially with games with integrated online features or functionality. Like, um, I'll give you a good case in point. I tried this uh, free-to-play game out on the PS4 um, earlier in 2017. And, again, it follows the same kind of cues as we see from a lot of free-to-play games. But one of the things about it is that progress you can only progress by playing against other players. Because when you be another player's whatever, I think there's their army or their base, you get experience, which is then used to upgrade and then move on to the next level and so on. So what happened was the entire bottom of that game dropped out. The only people who were playing it were, you know, high up, highest tier characters. So I couldn't find anyone to play against, which meant I couldn't earn experience. And basically, I the game is literally broken for me. I can't make any progress because they won't let me gain experience without fighting against someone. And that's one of those cases where if you're not careful, you can have this game just be unplayable. And it was my same thoughts with Sal Park Phone the Story, with the same way that they have PvP locks in the campaign. So if you can't find one to play against in PvP, you can't finish the rest of the campaign. Yeah, and wouldn't that suggest, and uh, again, I haven't played it, so you might know how it works better. Wouldn't that suggest if you get up to a certain level, like if you're the first person at this level, will you be able to play against anybody until someone else arrives? Mm. It sound, From what they, I was looking at, the brackets for PvP, or basically every five levels takes you to another... I guess, station or another area to play against. So, 
as long so you basically have five levels worth of PvP so I think that makes it a lot easier to find people but again with everyone rushing through like they make it very easy to level up in the first 10 levels or so but what happens like let's say in a year from now and no one new is coming into that game yeah no exactly I think mm -hmm. that you nail it what I what I'm imagining in my head is that like there's like somewhere between 20 and 100 uh, guys and gals out there who are at the very top echelon who have pushed it as far as they can mm -hmm. and they're just going to keep fighting each other as they get to those new servers every single time and there's no one else they're just going to know each other by because they are advanced mm -hmm. advancing beyond everybody else they're just going to be the only persons ever on their servers so yeah. it's just in my mind something that could be pretty funny yeah and it can reach that point again like when you start throwing money in that you know, someone can easily just buy up all the best cards or the best powers, and then they're essentially king of the hill until someone spends more money. But no one, how many people want to play a game like that where all of a sudden they hit a point where you must spend $200 or don't even bother showing up? Yeah, it's just the immediate arms race. And at a certain point, yeah, you're right. Like, you go into a game, and this is how I feel about Path of Exile. Mm -hmm. As I went into that game, and I'm like, well, I'm never going to catch up to 95% of the people who play this game. So why should I start? Um, that's the kind of feeling I think you're going to get after some time on the South Park game or what have you. Like Clash of Clans, like, I'm not going to play that game. It's just, it's been around too long. I'm going to be too uh, against the mm -hmm. curve or behind the curve. And yeah, you're right. That's going to happen with this game, and people are going to get, you know, drop out. You're going to have this weird, like, chasm of new players. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, excuse me, my voice seems to be dying on me here. But I was looking on about Marvel Heroes, and it looks like in January they did some kind of massive update to the game that changed a lot of the systems around and stuff like that. And I think that's another really interesting point about games as a service. I know we brought this up, but keeping a game going for years... I mean, in the short one, it sounds like a great idea, but how do you keep a game going and more importantly stable for four or five plus years? It just becomes a lot harder when you have, again, a very wide berth between new and existing players. Yeah, I think that that is a question for Blizzard. Mm -hmm. I think they know the answer to that question. Very few other people do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm trying to look. And it looks like a lot of people were very upset with that update. Yeah, and of course, the whales as well, as Alerto said. And we've, we've certainly talked about this, I'm sure. I mean, we'll bring this up tomorrow. But a lot of free-to-play and these kinds of games are explicitly aimed at the whales. Because they know the and, best. Oh, go ahead. No, it's, it's 100% accurate. But at the same time, that there's a percentage there's a, a percentage of whales you need to rely on to mm -hmm. make your game go and so if there's this chasm of new players that's that's going to happen um and the whales are going to drop out just like everybody else uh mm -hmm. because if they don't have people to beat then why would why would they spend their money um uh, just assuming they'll eventually get to the place where all the other big spenders are mm -hmm. um and yeah whales it's i hate that term so <laughs> much i i hate all of these terms and i hate the fact that uh, we're so blasé about saying, oh, we're just targeting the people with the money. Mm -hmm. uh, and they pay for everybody else's experience. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't mind that fact very much, but at the same time, like, you know, it's there are they're nicer terms out there, right? <laughs> you better be careful once you start working at 2K. They may put, like, a little chip in, in your all that if you say anything bad about loot boxes, you'll get, like, the little alarm. <laughs> Oh, I've been working in mobile for years. Uh, I, I, I'm familiar with all that territory. <laughs> I work in gambling now. That's what I'm leaving. So I'm I'm uh, quite familiar with how this stuff goes. Yeah. And um, so loot boxes are a step up from, from where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. I've heard the new term is calling them marquee DWP. people. <laughs> Key people. <laughs> but uh, getting back to Marvel Heroes, like... I've heard a lot of people say good things about the game, but this was like two, three years ago. And I just wonder how much that update really did change things. And more importantly, like, how much money did they actually need to bring in each month to keep supporting that? Because I know there are several free-to-play Marvel and DC games out there that are just, you know, 
monetize ripoffs. I've seen people like write scathing reviews of them, and they're still going pretty well these days. Well, when you have IP, like mm-hmm. that's the problem is you really have to mess something up for the IP to stop giving you money. Yeah, and that's where I believe like South Park is going to do okay because people love South Park, and um, and the Marvel thing is confusing because people love Marvel now. There are obviously always complications with the IP itself, and that might ruin the deal. But um, yeah, usually you're not going to run out of content or run out of players when you're talking about these just gargantuan blockbuster properties like this mm-hmm. yeah like um, I mentioned of course the uh, Marvel Puzzle Quest game that I was hooked on I want to say like 3-4 years ago and it was like the same thing like once you start getting into these games you can just see how much that monetization starts to kick in but of course with that IP it's such a strong motivator to get you back into playing it's also a very strong marketing idea as well, obviously. Because are you going to play a you know some no name you've never heard of match three game, or are you going to play a Marvel game or a DC game or a Nintendo game or stuff like that? Yeah, um, that's interesting, uh, El Goro. I had not heard that. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, uh, but yeah, I had not heard they were doing that. I thought Disney was was giving specific. Um, mm. per like uh, IP to like the deal. I thought ne- Disney and Netflix. And I know Disney is doing their own thing too. So maybe Marvel is just a piece of that. Um, so oh god, what was I saying? Oh yeah, yeah. I wanted to mention one thing. Uh, a game that my wife and I play, casual game. That's called mm-hmm. um, Disney. Oh god, what is it called? Emoji Emoji Blitz. Mm-hmm. Um, and this game is so popular, they're actually starting to sell. Uh, stuffed animals of the emoji mm-hmm. in the store. Um, <laughs> so um, one of the weird things this game does is it uses loot boxes. And you get you start, uh, there's like 50 or 60 characters that are all, you know, you buy a loot box and you randomly get a character. They're adding characters like five or six a month now. So each time there's a new character that comes out, your chances of getting any particular character go down. And so it's it's one of these weird things that the loot the loot boxes get worse and worse over time just because they keep adding new content. And but just like you say when a new character comes online, well you're excited about it. They just had a Star Wars one. So people who like the Star Wars characters, the new ones, mm-hmm. they would want these characters to come out and they will spend money just to get these little emoji. And and the the hook for this is you can actually use those emoji when you're messaging on the iPhone or or Android, I imagine as well. So it's there's a driver there for you to be mm-hmm. able to send pictures of these to your friends. Mm-hmm. But it's just this weird mathematical problem that I see, where I if I just want to randomly get a loot box for one of these Star Wars characters, um, it's likely to give me it's way more likely to, for me to get something else and no mm-hmm. Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, they're really playing with some really, I wouldn't say evil but some really um messed up ways to get people's money like kind of underhanded they're starting to realize that people aren't really mm-hmm. all that into uh the odds thing but they're they are pushing these properties really hard and leveraging them against uh fans yeah and i think you just brought up a really good point there rob regarding loot boxes one of the biggest i think issues with a lot of these loot boxes is that it's not a fixed system in the sense that if I pull, I don't know, let's say Luke Skywalker in an emoji, that means that I don't, I will never have to see that pop up in the loot box again. Instead, you can get duplicates, and though so, the more you play, the less chance you have of getting something that you want or getting something new. And of course, that's intentional. It's that downward uh, scaling to get you to spend more. So you're to acquire less. And I know people have been talking about this for a while now. To ju- One thing that would do a lot to alleviate these concerns is that all loot boxes offer one-time versions of those items. So if I get a, 
a short sword in an RPG from a loot box, I will never see that drop again in subsequent loot boxes. But of course, if you do that, then you throw out the whole monetization aspect right out the window, because it then means, of course, that there is a fixed number of loot boxes that each person will have to pull in order to get everything. But of course, what developer wants to do that? Well, what company wants to do that, the developer can do would do whatever they wanted mm -hmm. to if they could. Um, it's a it is it's a tough it's a tough thing. I mean, you are there's got to be. I got two things on this. I feel like there's got to be a uh, a ceiling for what people will put up with. At the same time, how does someone with a particular obsessive compulsive disorder, mm -hmm. how do they, I feel like they're targeted in something like this. Oh, yeah. Because that whole got to catch them all concept, mm -hmm. once you're involved in a game like this and there are items, well, you're going to want all those items and you're going to have to have them. Like, it's just it feels like they're the ones that are really like EA certainly is mm -hmm. uh, I feel like they're the ones who are really getting a, getting the worst end of this because someone like me certainly I like to complete a game like I, I will involve I will investigate mm -hmm. every little part of a level and stuff but if I had that kind of disorder and I had to pay to, to uncover all those little nooks mm -hmm. well they, they're going to be out of money like that's just how the brain's going to work and I feel like that is that is kind of dastardly. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. That's a. I wonder if that's going to come up tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. I know you guys are going to talk about a million things. So, right. and of course, a lot of these are also aimed at children. So you know, yeah. bright buttons uh, trying to confuse you with what the value is. And you see this in so many free to play games. Where they say, you know, you're getting a five hundred dollar value for nineteen ninety nine. And it's like, but what am I really buying? And I don't want to go into that too much here because I'm gonna, I know I'm going to be having this exact same talk in less than 24 hours from now. But um, let me see. There's anything else regarding Marvel Heroes? And that's always a shame when you see about these games that go on for so long that you know there are people who have invested probably $500 plus in that game, and that you know they're never going to see any of that value again. And it's the same thing we see out of the MMO genre. If a MMO that you really like goes under, it doesn't matter if you still have the original game files or the client. If there's no server, there's no game. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it will be very... I was mentioning this on Twitter. It's going to be very interesting to see what's EA's next move. Because I just wonder if this was a calculated to, as I learned say, they were trying to push the point. Now they know how far to go, they can, of course, walk it back for their next game is and avoid this controversy. Yeah, and I feel like that is that is certainly a good thing. I know one... Uh, actually, you know what? I feel like I've got to stop myself from doing this because, yeah, you're going to have a, a lot of content tomorrow, and I feel like it's going to be higher quality content than I can give <laughs> on this. I just It's one of those things we all... Like I got opinions and I just must get them out, but I feel like that's not that's not going to help things because uh, I can hear it all tomorrow from the <laughs> from the horse's mouth. All right. Well, I guess the last question then uh, that we'll have on the sum that we'll move on then uh, for you, Rob. What do you think EA is going to do next with Battlefront Two? Like, where do you think they're going to go from here? That I, I don't know. I, I am not the kind of person who um, knows how to leverage something for money. I have never known that. I, I will never know that. So the ideas that they're going to have are going to be things that I can't even imagine. Um, and I'll be like, oh, that's interesting. It's evil, but it's interesting. <laughs> that's kind of that's probably going to be the reaction no matter what happens. Yeah. I'm sure this is what we're going to hear about sooner than later, too. But I guess let's move on. I'm trying to see if there's any other news this week. Have you found anything on your end, Rob? Uh, no. I think we actually hit just about everything already in terms of the news that I've seen. Mm -hmm. It looks like uh, on Gamma Sutra, uh, NCSoft is closing a MOBA that they released, Master Cross Max Master, that's getting shut down. 
Uh, let's see. More news about that Dead by Daylight game. Have you ever played that one? Uh, no, I haven't. That is kind of the uh, uh, serial killer game, a lot like that Friday the 13th game, where mm. one player is a killer and he's hunting down a group of people in like these various areas. Yeah, I, I, I don't know much about either of those. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Let's bring up Steam again. Oh, I need to add this to my wish list. <laughs> Actually, no, that's a bad idea. <laughs> I'm on the Bucket Detective, and I'm like, adding it to my wish list is like throwing a uh, a penny into a wish fountain. Uh, it's like, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I could find my penny, but it would take an awful lot of uh, effort. Just add it to my cart. And what is the other one? What is the one you just said? Uh, the, uh, Dead by Daylight. Yeah, That one there. seems to be getting some traction, although I hear a lot of people complain about the balance of it in terms of like how they add new characters in. And that's another very interesting point, like going back to what we were saying with the free-to-play content. You notice in a lot of games, whenever something new gets added, it's always going to be stat or rank higher than everything else, and then will eventually be tuned down. I know a lot mm. of people always feel that's just developers over-tuning something to get interest, you know, get like that new new game smell on it kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how a lot of that tuning works. I'll probably find out very quickly <laughs> in the next uh, couple months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did hear that. Although they just released Freddy Krueger as a new character in Dead by Daylight. They also have Michael Myers, too. I just wonder if they'll eventually get a, a Jason or will he remain in that Friday the 13th game? Which, speaking of which, I'm wondering how that game is doing, because it had a lot of complaints and issues at launch. Yeah. All it takes is for Dead by Daylight like, to convince the uh, IP owner, and that's that's all there is to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots and lots of negative reviews on Friday the 13th. And yeah, there was reports. I guess here's a question for you, Rob. I don't know how much you can go into detail about this, but one of the announcements that came from the developer, what was it, Gun Media or Ilphonic, they said that they were working on a second game and that it wasn't going to be with the same team as Friday the 13th. Like they were basically developing two games concurrently. Is that often seen for a lot of smaller developers, or is there more behind that than they're actually revealing? Uh, could you repeat the specific circumstance? Uh, they said that they are going. They basically split the team into two. One part of the team is working on Friday the Thirteenth, and mm -hmm. the other part of the team is working on an unannounced game. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, so you're wondering if that's normal or not? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is. I mean, the way I've always looked at third-party uh, developers are every third-party developer I've ever either worked with or have known they never wanted to be a third-party developer. They wanted to do their own content. And so in order to make money, they become third-party developers. And so I imagine in a situation like this where they have something that's relatively popular and possibly making money, they're like, okay, now's the time, and they'll push their team off to their original IP. Um, and then should that contract go away for some reason, they're going to have to go back to the, the grind. But usually that seems to be the case as far as I can tell every third party developer is looking for that that opening that they can get their their fresh IP out out the door. Mm -hmm. And I know when it was announced a lot of people saw it as kind of like the end for the Friday the 13th game. I know it's still being updated now, but again like it's we've talked about this before with multiplayer driven games if the community drops out there's nothing you can really do to get that back at that point. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, were you about to say something? No, I, I was not going to say <laughs> I realized that I had nothing to say. Mm. Oh, um, Elgora brought up a really good point. This is an interesting one. It was announced this week that PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds is nominated for Game of the Year at this year's Game of the Year Awards, and I find that very unusual. And as Elgora pointed out, the game is still in early access, it's still played by technical problems, and it, it sounds more like a publicity stunt to me, that they're just trying to ride the waves of that game. Yeah, I, I see it the same way. Um, it's it's a little 
callous and possibly cynical to think so but at the same time you're like well mm -hmm. if it looks like a duck you know it, it does it's it's a little weird that it would get that mm -hmm. i know it's popular but it's not the most popular it's I, um it, yeah it's a very interesting thing to go over and uh certainly it does it, it does not pass the smell test mm -hmm. um so we'll i guess we'll just have to see what comes of that uh hopefully it does not win so uh, it's hard yeah. to, it's hard for me to even imagine because there's there's a lot of great games that come out every year. Mm -hmm. And what's very interesting is I know I'm looking at the game awards list, and this was one thing that I didn't bring up, but I thought it was very interesting. They have a new reward for best ongoing game, and that is a little weird to me, especially the nominations for it. So they're basically trying to see what's the best game, like games as a service. So they have Destiny 2, Grand Theft Auto, Overwatch, Battlegrounds, Rainbow Six Siege, and Warframe. But why not Payday 2? It's been out for four years and still going on. And wouldn't you include something like World of Warcraft in that as well? Like, again, like it seems like it's more for the buzz than for actually having something credible. Uh, yeah, and 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 this is. That is one of those things, right? You can't take World of Warcraft off of that list. You just never can. <laughs> exactly. It's been it's been an ongoing game as long as ongoing games have been around. Almost. It it's it well if it goes away, then it'll be like you say, it'll be the apocalypse. Exactly. <laughs> um, or some crazy thing coming out. Maybe they have a sequel. Uh, whatever mm. that means in the MMO business. But yeah, it, yeah I feel like you got to have those those games in there if you just introduce something you gotta have the ones that have been going forever mm -hmm. and don't show signs of stopping um cause you could you could have a two year game that's been going on that's great and all but it's not gonna last another year so what are the what are the um how do you rate them together how do you do that uh it's a tough call yeah and there's only some weird awards on here there's uh I just saw it let me go back down here is there's the trending gamer award. I I don't know what that means exactly. Something tells me I won't be on that list anytime soon. Uh, let's see, best esports players going to be an award. Like that stuff sounds kind of weird. Like I thought that the game awards is for like developers and the games themselves. Like it just seems again like trying to ride the coattails of something. It is. I feel like uh, like these awards things can just go off the rails. Um, certainly, best esports player <laughs> could be an esports awards show as opposed to a games awards show. It's yeah. not like a an esports legend or player is not. I wouldn't necessarily call them part of the games industry. Mm -hmm. They certainly work for the games industry and work in the games industry. But it's not quite the same. Mm -hmm. They are players of games, not makers of games. Um, it's been a sellout since a couple. Of, mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I think all award shows are that mm -hmm. way. I I cannot watch award shows. I never. It's never a good um, experience for me, and I certainly don't care who wins most of the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then, um, oh! I just realized that means I got to start coming with my game of the year list in a few weeks too. <laughs> Serious as gaming press by now, boy. You you just got some shade thrown at you, Josh. Mm, well, I call myself a game design journalist, so hopefully that I can avoid some of those arrows <laughs> like that. But yeah, oh man, we could certainly talk about uh, game journalists. But what time is it? What are we up to? Yeah, we're over an hour, and that's a good, I think, thirty forty minute discussion easily. And maybe we can do that for when you come back after. Yeah. Uh, in two weeks, or yeah, assuming there's no, no news that comes out, and and that's actually good timing because the Black Friday, uh, or what what are they calling it, the autumn sale or whatever? I don't it's, know. it's I think it's called the Black Friday sale. It's starting uh, a week from today, and uh, that will mean I'm actually going to get some new games because I have sixty dollars in my <laughs> Taku. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. You need to take all. You need to get all those um, uh, domains immediately. Mm -hmm. Gotta copyright those ASAP. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, I got the sale, so I'm finally going to get some new games and uh, that I can play. And um, and by new games, I mean games that have been out for a couple years. <laughs> so. Uh, you can finally start to thin your uh, bat your uh, wish list on Steam. Yeah, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> I'm probably gonna buy games none of which are on my wish list. This is gonna be just sad. My <laughs> wish list games are gonna be so jealous. <laughs> oh man, yeah. So at some point in the summer, we'll have to do a game of the year uh, award show here. You know, we'll be completely uh, non-biased there, right? You know, my game, us, my game of the year award is going to be like from from 2012. I always forget what games come out each year, so it'll be very interesting to try and remember all the games I've played or this year. Yeah. Um. What was I gonna? I was just gonna say something, but I forgot what it was already. Oh, right. So interesting news on my end that I might be forced to get a Switch. Oh. <laughs> I still want a Switch. Maybe we'll see something during Black Friday or whatever. Yeah, I have a feeling that there's no switch on the planet that's actually going to go down in cost unless yeah. some retailer decides to do it as like a a push to get people in the doors. Um, but hey. oh, uh, go yeah, ahead. I'm I mean that's that's the one I'm going to need to use for my job. Uh, at least as far as I know, I don't know exactly what they're going to push console wise, but I know the the game itself is very popular on Switch uh, NBA 2K. Mm. Maybe I'll get lucky and someone will do like a pricing error on a Switch during Black Friday. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, one year, I was like, it was like late at night, and I saw that Walmart accidentally mispriced all their HD, like big screen TVs for like ten dollars. Oh no! And by the time I got to it, it was already shut off. I'm like, damn it! I could have cleaned up there. Like, I always miss those big things. So hopefully, I get it happen one point. Some rogue employee. <laughs> All right. But I think we'll wrap things up for this week. I still need to think of some games to play. So for you guys watching, if you have any suggestions for games for the streams, definitely let me know. I did. Um, I will be posting on Patreon for the VIP to vote for this Saturday's grab bag probably tonight. And I will be doing the Games of Ill Repute analysis. I'm going to put the spreadsheet up for you guys over on Patreon.com to vote on. And I figure I'll pretty much give, I think, one week. Maybe I'll make like, a little announcement video for Thanksgiving about what game I'll look for. So we'll give it one week or a little bit less than that starting tomorrow, and we'll see what game I pick. But with that said, thank you so much for watching our weekly show. Again, Rob, it was a pleasure hanging out with you. Since I won't Always. talk to you next week, or but we'll chat on Discord, hope you have a great Thanksgiving. Yeah, same to you and same to all of you watching. Mm-hmm. So we'll be taking next week off, and we'll I'll be back the following Thursday, and we'll hopefully see Rob the Thursday after that with a giant Take-Two banner behind him and loot boxes surrounding him like <laughs> like the birds in the, the Alfred Hitchcock movie. You're gonna, I'm going to be like the, the guy in the Home Improvement. with uh, <laughs> You can only see his eyes. Because I'm going to be stacked with, with loot boxes. Thank you, El Gordo. <laughs> All right. So I'll be trying to find something to play for tonight. So I'll be back on a little bit later. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Check back for daily discussions on game design. No here promises. And on game wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games. Be sure to tune in for the Friday Live podcast with Ramin. We'll be going at about loot box and free to play design. So it should be a lot of fun. And Rob, if you want to tell everybody uh, what you're streaming. Um, as always, uh, Torchlight 2. But uh, come on to, to RNG Gods TV tomorrow, uh, Saturday morning, early Saturday morning on the Pacific Coast. It's 12 a.m., so right at midnight. Uh, so on the East Coast, it's a little late, Josh, uh, 3 a.m. But um, certainly around the world, it's a really fun time. A bunch of us get together and play multiplayer games. And so uh, mm -hmm. you get some really cool people. A lot of good streamers all come together to uh, make that happen. So, uh, yeah, check it out. Um, and then I'll be – I stream on that channel as well now almost exclusively. So Torchlight 2, occasionally I'll jump into something else. I started mm -hmm. Endless Space, as I mentioned earlier. So I might go back to that one. Who knows? <laughs> And you gotta play Grim Dawn at some point too. Oh, that's on my list. Yeah, I'm definitely <laughs> we'll gonna get that it. over. 
I'm going to get that, unless it doesn't go on sale for some crazy reason, but I'm definitely going to get it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, as Alora says, be sure, don't get corrupted, and bring some of those uh, take two bucks back for us. <laughs> Everyone will, just like I will th- give it a shot. Throw loot boxes at everybody. Just like, yeah. you get a loot box, and you get a I loot mean, box. Knock on wood that this project actually really uh, takes off, but mm-hmm. we'll, we'll see that over the next six months how it goes. Awesome, and hopefully I'll have some more news regarding uh, more consulting work as well. And again, if you are looking for someone or know someone, be sure to get in touch. You'll find all the information on the Game Wisdom website under Services. But that is going to do it. So thanks again for watching. Like I said, have a great Thanksgiving. We'll be back, or I'll be back in two weeks. But of course, there'll be regular videos between now and then. So have a great night, folks, and I guess we'll see you when we see you. But till then, take care.